Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the third edition of Berlin Tech, uh, Tech Leads. Once again, we are fully digital, so we're happy to welcome attendees from Berlin, Germany, the EU, uh, maybe even from other places, other continents. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, in case you haven't been here before, um, this meetup is, is a group for various technical leaders. Obviously, we're all here. Uh, tech leads, engineering managers, directors, you name it. Uh, this is so that we can share our experiences and, and learn from one another. What, what's been pop, this is something that's been popular with the Vinted and, and Vilnius for some time. And we're also trying to make this thing something that happens in, in Berlin regularly so that we all have a platform to do this. Uh, we believe that leadership is something that you'll learn, not something that you're you're born with. Everybody can can do this. We believe that each of our, our meetups have a, a, a specific intent, but everybody can learn something from, from uh, what the topic that we're going to discuss. This one is about progressive shipping strategies. Now, that's what the, the speakers have in common. They work within shipping and, and logistics, but what they have even more in common, and maybe in common with some of you, is that they've been part of a organization that has grown dramatically to meet the needs of its uh, customers and, and its employees and its stakeholders. So if you hadn't attended the previous two sessions, we had two of them so far. One of them was in March and the second in June. We had some great speakers uh, on sustainability. We had some things on, on leadership and, and how to foster that within your organization, the communication. Uh, so the, all of these things are about presenting diverse Op opinions and insights and how we uh, can interpret these different topics. So we like to ensure that a, the tech community has some food for thought and aspects that they might not have considered yet. So if you have questions, if you are, are thinking about this and something pops into your mind, maybe other people haven't thought of it, maybe they have, but they haven't posted it in the questions, please do that. That's why we have this, we have this uh, YouTube questions and, and, and comments stream right here. I will be monitoring that. I'll be trying to engage with you while we while we listen to the speakers talk to see what we can do to draw out all of us and, and participate. It's especially hard when we're doing this event online. So uh, we want to encourage this this lively exchange between all the professionals here. I'm a professional. Our speakers, Stefan and, and Aista, are professionals. And you are professionals too, so let's all share our information together. So today's topic is, again, the one with progressive shipping strategies. What does that mean? So tech companies obviously operate in the digital world, but we need to deliver whatever we do um, to customers in the real world. Sometimes that's just delivering software. Sometimes it's actually del delivering physical goods, uh, which is the case with, with our first speaker, Aista. So most of the time, it's not restricted to one single country, or, 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 or you know, but actually crosses several borders. The, the challenge of each one of these companies is that uh, cross-border shipping in infrastructure in Europe is highly fragmented. It lacks affordability, convenience, and connectivity that can help us give the people that use our services a, a winning feeling and, and drive that flywheel. And let's be honest. To, in order to truly have a positive impact with a company's offering, that company needs to take the entire uh, cycle into consideration, not only the product itself, but what it looks like when we are developing these services, when we're asking for feedback, when we're taking that feedback and using it to drive our innovation flywheels to make things better. So how do you successfully set up a, com a complex third-party carrier infrastructure? How do you successfully set up a, a successful third-party software infrastructure. So uh, have these things in mind, have these questions in mind. We have we have two great speakers uh, today. Again, Stefan, who is the CTO at Seven Centers. But first, Aista, who is the Senior Director of Engineering at Vinted, taking care of our uh, uh, Vinted Go shipping offer. Usually we have three speakers, and I'm sorry, uh, one of them got sick. So uh, Leonard Van Kleist from Hive can't uh, be with us tonight, but that might give us more time to talk about the things that are important to us and the things that we learn from our speakers. 
Uh, we will have a Q&A after each speaker's presentation. And we can have a Q&A afterwards if we want to talk about things that are a bit broader topic, if, if there's a desire there. But I have a question for you all first off, in, including our speakers. Because I was, I was thinking the other day, Isa and I first met when Vinton was just a little bit bigger than half the size it is today. Any guesses on how long ago that was? Don't answer, I'll tell you. It, that was about 18 months ago. 18 months ago, and we, we've doubled in size. We've gone from around 700, 800 people to almost 1,400 today. I'm sure Stefan has a, a similar stories in his repertoire. I'm sure some of you do too. So I want to hear about that. Please post in the, the chat uh, stream here what size the organization you're at today was when you joined, and then slash whack what size it, uh, what size it is today, just so we can all get a feel for how fast and quickly our, the organizations that we work for are, are growing. And, I, and I'll take a look over here. I got to take a peek. I'm sorry here. And I'll call out some of these things that seem interesting. Dorian said, says hello. But Dorian, how big was the organization that you worked for when you joined and how big is it today? Isa, how big was it when you joined? It was smaller than when I joined. How big is it yeah. today? So, uh, hi everyone. <laughs> Before I start speaking, hi everyone. Um, so yeah, I joined Vinted a bit more than two years ago and it was, uh, I can't remember exactly, but it was between three and 400 people, I think, when I joined. Now it's uh, 1,400 at Vinted, but uh, more interestingly, shipping when I joined was just one team, like one team, 10 engineers, well, 10, 10 people in the team, I think six engineers. Uh, now we have more than 160 people working just uh, just uh, on on the shipping side. So, uh, yeah, I would say ten, tenfold uh, uh, is is uh, the growth at uh, at on the shipping side, and then several times uh, on vintage side. Quite uh, I, quite the growth. I see that there are 18 people connected to this. One of them is me. So I, I expect to see 17 responses in there. I want, I want to talk to you all about all this at, at the end and, and talk about how, you know, what, what are the things that you heard from our speakers today, which really resonated with you, which you want to take back to your organizations while you deal with this kind of growth, no matter if you're in shipping logistics, no matter if you're in, in product engineering, but what you, you've learned today so that we can talk about this stuff. So with that, our, you know, we, we've met Aista Mish Kunyinye. Did I get that right? I still, you're gonna. You, I, I've been working on my Lithuanian pronunciation. She is that senior director of engineering at Vinted. She's a great person, great friend of mine. Uh, I said we'll talk about how Vinted created this this new shipping business, the one that she says really just like grew from a, a small domain into its own business unit, and the challenges and the opportunities that the tech teams that she works with, the, actually the the whole product engineering teams, uh, you know what challenges and opportunities they are facing. So I still, I'm going to hand the stage over to you. It's all yours. Hello, everyone. Um, can you see and hear me well? I hope so. Um, so uh, once again, my name is Aiste Mishkunine. Uh, Adam was pretty close to pronouncing it. <laughs> and I'm the engineering director at uh, Vinted or Vinted Go. So uh, today I wanted to tell you why we created Vinted Go as a new spin-off from Vinted. Um, and also what are the challenges and opportunities that the tech teams are facing with this, uh, with this new uh, carrier business. Um, but before I, I jump into the um, challenges and opportunities, I want to tell you a bit more about why we created Vinted Go. Uh, what, were the, um, what were the problems that we were trying to solve? What were the problems that we realized uh, while uh, at Vinted? Um, so Vinted, um, if you... Um, if you're not familiar, is a secondhand fashion marketplace, and we are operating across uh, the Europe, and, and uh, we are a marketplace that allows uh, buyers 
and sellers to meet and sell and buy their secondhand uh, fashion uh, items. Um, beneath that, we also have the shipping. So when you are buying or selling an item, you can also uh, use our integrated shipping. Um, and, and that really helps, uh, helps the users to have the full experience, you know, as if you were buying an item on the, you know, on Amazon, eBay, or, or, or on the merchant side. Um, so it really makes the, the experience uh, very close to the, to the uh, you know, to the first hand fashion um, experience. And what we discovered um, as uh, one of the, one of the important things uh, to our members during our uh, time at, at Vinted is that, it's not a secret that for our uh, members, uh, price is important. So um, one of the key reasons um, why users are using Vinted is, of course, sustainability. Um, then saving money while buying secondhand fashion and also earning money um, by selling secondhand fashion. So, so uh, price is always always uh, you know a, a, a key or maybe not necessarily the key but but a thing in a user's consideration um, and imagine if you were to buy a five uh, euro uh, item uh, let's say a t-shirt at vinted um, and you would uh, you would go for the checkout and then you would you would select the shipping option and the shipping um, in Europe and especially if you are, maybe buying an item from a different country can be, uh, you know, half the price of the item or even double the price of the item because you are buying a, a, an item that is really, you know, affordable. Um, and that makes a big uh, impact to our users. So uh, it's, it's more difficult for a user to decide to actually buy a secondhand fashion item if uh, shipping price is, you know, half of the item price. So we, we realize that uh, through also various other things. So for example, when we are launching a new market, when we are entering a, a new market, uh, we sometimes also launch uh, shipping discount campaigns, um, meaning that we, uh, we provide either free shipping or you know, very cheap shipping. And what we see is that the growth um, uh, of our user base in that market really accelerates really fast during that period of the shipping discount. So it also shows how important the shipping price is to our users. And we, we realized that if we could actually um, provide a very affordable shipping uh, for, our, for our users, for our members, that would really accelerate our vision of making secondhand fashion first choice. Uh, people would be so much more inclined to use uh, and buy secondhand fashion if the shipping was affordable. So we started dreaming crazy, crazy things like, wouldn't it be amazing if we could provide one euro or below shipping across Europe, uh, and and I know that's that's like a huge aspiration. It's not it's not something that you know is set in stone, but but something that we started thinking about and started decomposing into. So what would we need to do in order to to uh, provide the affordable price to the user that would encourage user to use uh, secondhand, you know, to buy secondhand fashion more often. Um, so one thing that we that we started doing as Vinted grew is uh, we started leveraging our shipping volumes to reduce the cost to our members. Um, again, it's not a secret that you know if you buy uh, in bulk any items, uh, even in the store, you know you buy two, you, you you have a discount. You buy three, you have a bigger discount. The same goes with uh, with shipping. The bigger volumes you have, the lower the prices. Um, how we you know how we operate is that we integrate in Europe with. Uh, with various shipping providers. Uh, currently, we have more than 40 uh, integrations with different shipping providers. And when you buy an item on Vinted, we are uh, proposing you, you know, various options on which shipping providers you want to send or to receive that item. I uh, still can, can I break in real quick here? I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, are, you, are you supposed to be showing us slides? I can see them in your glasses, possibly. Oh, yes, I am showing the slides. Can you not see them? No, let's fix that. Is it uh, stuck on the first slide, or are you not seeing the slides? I'm not seeing you so far, which is which is not bad. However, <laughs> you see the but there we I, go, prepared, there we I, go. I prepared the slides, so it would be nice uh, for you to see the slides as well. Perfect, Can you, you got it now. Cool. So you didn't miss much. Uh, I, I I'm not very 
uh, elaborate on my slides. So that's the only thing that you missed. <laughs> that's how we discovered the, the price sensitivity of our users. Um, yes, and then in terms of leveraging the volumes. So as mentioned, you know, we are, um, we, we started growing and we noticed that, you know, the, the more volumes we provide to our uh, shipping providers, uh, the lower the prices. So at the moment, uh, Vinted is uh, shipping more than 300 million parcels a year. And that's a, ha that's a huge, huge volume. And, and by that, we, of course, can drive the prices uh, down and provide those lower prices to, to our members. So that's one thing that we did. You know, we start leveraging our volumes to, to, uh, to drive the cost uh, and the prices down. Um, another thing is that we, um, um, we started connecting different markets um, with local uh, carriers, with local smaller players. Um, so when we are shipping an item, let's say from, you know, uh, Germany to France, we can, you know, we have multiple options on how to do that. We can use um, big international uh, shipping providers that already have this uh, international network, but of course their prices are higher. Um, it's a bit more difficult to, to negotiate the price down because they are big, they are international companies. Uh, but what we realized is that if we use uh, small local shipping providers and with our technology, we connect them into a chain uh, of international shipment, uh, we actually can uh, significantly reduce uh, the price of the overall shipment. shipments. So let's say um, if you are sending the item from Italy to, uh, to Netherlands, we could, uh, you know, we through our technology, we can instruct the uh, shipping providers in Italy to ship the item to the uh, northern Italian border. Then in France, we can instruct another shipping provider to ship the item from France to Germany and so on. So this is purely with technology. We, we haven't uh, you know, even touched at that point yet the, the physical, the physical uh, fulfillment. Uh, but just with technology, we managed to, you know, to connect those smaller local uh, uh, carriers and lower the prices. Um, so we've done that, but uh, but that was uh, that was not enough. Even with uh, with those two things, uh, we still were not uh, reaching the the price that we want to uh, you know to to provide to our members. Um, and uh, we we thought you know what we could do next, and um, the next uh, natural point was to actually go into physical fulfillment. The reason why we were not able to reach that price point, what, what we wanted was um, most of the carriers, uh, they provide different services. So they provide a home to home, for example, shipment. They can ship uh, large bulky items. They can ship heavy items. And that also means that they have limitations on how um, streamline their processes uh, can be, how automated their sortation lines can be. So if you have the commitment to your users to be able to ship, you know, something as bulky and heavy as a fridge, but also as small as, you know, a t-shirt, um, there are different limitations, you know, various limitations as to how you can optimize your, let's say, sortation. And that, of course, means that you have certain price uh, and, and certain margin in, in, your, uh, in your shipment price. At Vinted, we mostly deal with um, small to medium, sometimes large items, but even a large item is, you know, that large, not fridge size item. Um, so we realize that we can actually reduce this price even more if we start doing uh, sortation ourselves, if we go into that physical fulfillment um, and we optimize the sortation lines, we optimize every, you know, single process because we can, because we can predict the, uh, uh, the size and the weights of, of the packages. We also realize that the, the cheapest option um, uh, to, uh, uh, to pick up the items and to deliver the items is actually not home to home, um, but uh, we, we have a, a term we call PUDA. PUDA stands for pick up, drop off. So it can be a point where you either bring your parcels for uh, the shipping or you pick up uh, the parcels when delivering. It can be a locker, 
uh, like a physical you know, metal box with different uh, uh, compartments in it. It can be a shop, but the key element in it is that it is a point where you collect the parcels in bulk and then you deliver parcels sort of in bulk. So the driver only has to go to one point to pick up the parcels instead of, for example, driving around the neighborhood and trying to deliver the item multiple times or pick up the, uh, the item multiple times. So we realized that with, with those elements, you know, with, with being able to optimize uh, sortation lines and going into physical fulfillment, uh, we can drive the prices uh, down, but also uh, providing the uh, PUDO to PUDO uh, deliveries, not home to home, uh, we can also uh, drive the costs even, even uh, lower. Um, so that's what we decided to do. That's how uh, the, the thought of Vinted Go was born that, you know, we are, we have been doing all these steps to reduce the prices. Uh, we need to actually become a carrier uh, company. And that's how Vinted Go was, uh, was born. Um, so what do we do as a, as a company? So uh, one thing that we, uh, we already did is in June, we launched our physical lockers uh, in Paris. We currently have 55 lockers. Uh, physical metal boxes where you can uh, leave your uh, shipment, your parcel, or you can pick it up. Um, with that, we also have the warehouse in Paris. We also are, uh, you know, we have the, the fleet that is servicing those, uh, those lockers. Um, so, so all of that, like physical infrastructure is, is, is starting up. We are uh, planning to scale it uh, a lot next year. So that's just uh, like the first phases of it. The second thing is that we thought if we can um, if we can have a really affordable shipping, uh, not only Vinted would benefit from it, but other businesses as well. Uh, it would be amazing to actually open this up for other businesses. So many other businesses would benefit from from really affordable uh, international shipping in Europe. So we decided to create a platform for businesses and start uh, providing the shipping services to, to the uh, outside businesses as well. Uh, we already have uh, uh, that platform created. So of course it's, it's always in progress in terms of you know, making it better and better, but uh, we already have it live. And, uh, and the third thing, it's not, it's not uh, you know, a particular like deliverable as well, uh, but uh, by uh, focusing on PUDO to PUDO uh, deliveries, uh, we realize that it's, it's also uh, making um, shipping more in my, in, in my environmentally friendly. Um, uh, naturally, because you are saving on you know, fuel and, and, and uh, time and other things while uh, you know, picking up and delivering in bulk versus uh, a driver driving around in the neighborhood and picking up from home. Um, we are also looking at different other options on how to further reduce CO2 impact from, uh, from shipping. And that is, for example, looking at how to power our lockers with sustainable energy, how to power our warehouses with sustainable energy, looking into sustainable or reusable packaging for, for the parcels that, uh, that uh, our users uh, send. Um, so there are, there are various ways that we are looking into it, but, but this, this aspect is really, really uh, important uh, for them to go. Um, and, and finally, almost probably to the most uh, interesting or most relevant part is uh, now that we have created this, um, this business, what is the angle from the engineering side? What does it mean for us? What are the challenges? What are the opportunities that, that we have and how are we dealing with it? Um, so um, I'll have five slides on this. That's the, that's the first one. Um, so the, the first um, challenge that we were facing is how do we launch uh, lockers? Uh, until now, we were only working as engineering um, in Vinted. You know, it was part of Vinted. Um, so we've never built anything for uh, physical, uh, you know, infrastructure like like lockers. And uh, and another thing is that when we decided to launch lockers, I think it was January, February this year, and we put a very like a, a, a very um, um, aspirational date, but but quite an aggressive aspirational date uh, of June to go live with our first lockers. 
Uh, so, so from beginning to the end, the project took about five months until the, the launch of the first uh, batch of lockers and we had to do um, a lot of things. So we had to do lockers interface, you know, the screen that you see in the locker that you interact with to pick up or drop off your parcel. Uh, we had to do the driver's app, the drivers who are servicing the, the locker and picking up or dropping off the parcels. Uh, we had to, to do the parcel scanning um, at the locker, but also at the warehouse. Uh, we had to do operational interface where you can see all the operations and the statuses of the of the shipments, uh, various dashboards that our operations use and so on. So there were a lot of things that our developers uh, needed to do. Um, it was one team that was working on it, very, very quick, very efficient team, and we managed to deliver this in, in five months. So, so the first um, uh, challenge is, of course, you know, uh, creating um new deliveries uh, in the fields that we have never worked before but also the opportunity here is that while we are still small we can actually build things fast learn from it iterate and then you know make it better uh, when uh, you know uh, when you build something from scratch when you don't have customers uh, relying on it you can actually be very brave and in, in, into you know how you make the decisions and how you how you build the technology, how you make the various decisions, um, and then of course when you learn from it, you you become better and better. But that's I think an interesting interesting comparison to Vinted, where uh, you know we for example every single feature that we release we do A B test uh, because it it could potentially make such a big impact um, uh, to to Vinted. Here we can be very brave, very fast, and, and deliver a lot in a short period of time. Um, another uh, challenge or opportunity is uh, uh, with you know with the speed, uh, of course, comes a a need for looking for various ways to to work. So so how we were used to work when we were um, you know very much part of Vinted was uh, you know quite a, a standard uh, scrum sometimes kanban um, but uh, here at vintage go we decided that we you know we, we can be more uh, creative you know with our approaches we can try out different ways of working we can uh, you know, you, you want to work in, in, in uh, Scrum and Kanban and Scrum Band, something else, or maybe you want to, uh, you know, do you need two weeks uh, sprints? Do you not need sprints at all? And so different, you know, various teams can, can choose uh, their own ways of working uh, and, and they do, and they find the way that works, uh, works for them. Again, nothing groundbreaking, but something that was, um, that was interesting that, you know, we not only allow but we encourage uh, teams to find different ways that uh, that uh, work for them we also uh, really uh, want to uh, um, leverage uh, the experimentation and the uh, brilliant ideas that come not only from engineering but from from entire organization um, so each uh, at the end of each quarter we are doing one week of uh, experimentation that we call x week um, and everyone can pitch their ideas, gather the teams together to work on those ideas. So for one week, uh, the teams are not working on their uh, usual roadmaps, but are working on uh, various uh, various ideas um, uh, that would, you know, benefit the business or benefit the, you know, engineering quality and so on. Um, the third. Um, challenge, uh, of course, opportunity to learn, but a challenge as well was developing solutions for physical equipment. Uh, lockers is, is a perfect example for that. Um, so we've never before, for example, had to worry about, uh, you know, internet connection uh, for our end users. Uh, we were building websites, we were building apps. Um, so for us, that was never on our mind. Now with lockers, we actually have to care about internet connection and, and internet connection can be influenced by, for example, the uh, structure of the building that this locker is in. Um, so we, we need to take care uh, of, of things like that and to think from engineering side of, you know, so what do we do if the internet is, uh, you know, signal is weak? What do we do if the locker goes offline and how do we sync the data? 
when the locker is offline and so on. So, so some things that we have never thought of before. Also from uh, from testing side, for example, uh, of course we are used to you know to um, uh, testing the uh, UI, but with lockers we actually needed to start thinking. Okay, so someone needs to go around each of the locker and test: uh, is it not raining on the locker? How the screen looks like? Is you know the sun shining uh, or not shining into the screen? Is it visible enough? You know how about accessibility? Can you freely walk up to the locker? Isn't you know nothing obstructing it and so on? So the testing scenario suddenly become so much wider. You actually have to test you know are all the doors opening and closing and so on. So for us that was something new and it was an aha moment of oh my god we actually have to you know to create test plans for physical testing. So uh, that was uh, that was of course you know a challenge, but also a very interesting challenge uh, that you know we 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 are learning a lot and we've learned a lot uh, from that. Um, the 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 fourth challenge and opportunity is that um, before that as mentioned our sort of internal client was was vintage. Now that we are opening it up for external clients, uh, we find ourselves in a completely new set of challenges. Um, for example, um, how we, we, we used to do support when we only had Vinted uh, was through Slack channel, uh, very, you know, similar way how other startups uh, uh, support, uh, you know, the, the internal operations of how we solve incidents. It's via Slack. Now we no longer can do that. Now that we are starting to have external clients, we need to start uh, thinking about proper tools and proper processes to you know to resolve incidents to respond to incidents to respond to uh, tickets and so on and i know that that might sound basic for companies who are really like well established uh, or already dealing with uh, with external customers but for us again it was an aha moment that oh so now we will have to do this and we will have to have like mature operations and the team responsible for that and tools and processes the same goes with slas uh, now we suddenly realize that okay so we we now have to actually set our SLAs and we have to commit to our SLAs and, and we have to make sure that, you know, we are able to keep it uh, at the level that we want. Again, through, you know, the quality of our delivery, through the quality of our support and, and, and so on. And, uh, and uh, once we created our first API um, that the external customers could integrate with us, I, I remember that moment when we were like, oh, so now we have the first version, but we'll have the second and the third. And what do we do with that when when we already have the clients on the first version? So again, that might sound sound basic for for other uh, companies who are in it for a longer period of time, but for us it was it was that another aha moment that okay, so we have to start thinking about uh, about versioning of the API and how we go about it and how we support the previous versions and so on. Um, the same goes with external authentication. So far, it was just our internal users and users of Vinted that we you know care about in terms of authentication. Now we have external businesses that are um, that are uh, using our services as well. So a lot of a lot of engineering challenges that are related with external. Uh, users, external businesses connecting to something that was uh, quite closed up uh, before. Um, yes, and and the the challenges of the future uh, is you know as mentioned that we we want to automate and optimize our processes as much as possible, and and what that means that uh, you know we will start looking into again, physical things uh, in order to automate the sortation lines, automate the scanning of the parcels in the warehouse, relabeling of the parcels in the warehouse. Um, there, are, there are large machines and you know, conveyor belts to do that, but from an uh, from, uh, engineering perspective, uh, we will have a lot of things that we have never worked before. We have never worked with that physical, uh, you know, infrastructure before, and we'll have to learn how to do that. Um, the same goes for, for example, uh, routing technology for drivers. Uh, again, a completely new set of challenges that we have never worked before. And then the, the natural next step is, is uh, robotics, uh, for example. Uh, skills that we don't have at the moment that we will we will need to start looking into and we will need to start learning and, and I'm pretty sure that we will have a lot of learnings in that and a lot of success and and, and failures that we will be able to maybe you know share in the future as well. 
Um, so that's uh, that's about it. Um, thank you. I hope that uh, that uh, it was useful, or at least some parts of it was uh, was useful. Um, and we can jump into Q and A. Apparently you need to unmute yourself. This is something I have not learned over three years of pandemic work from homishness. So thank you, Aista. Very interesting. Thank you for bringing us on, on that journey and, and telling us about the things that you've had to learn and the things that you're going to have to learn to make to pull this one off. I know from the inside, it's not easy. It's physical, it's software, it's vendors, it's all these and very complicated, all while growing that. Um, I think I got ice to beat on on the acceleration or on the uh, the the delta because when I started in Berlin, I was the only one. Ah, nice. Yeah, yeah. But but yeah. Not, but now there's almost 200 of us, so that's so that's great. But uh, enough bragging from my side. We have some questions. So uh, Gregor wants to know about um, the uh, like the mindset and in, in, in the, the like the tools and thinking that you used in order to get those insights about what people wanted and what the business could do for that and, and you know be, become successful in that so how, how did how did we come how do we uh, find those things so in, in terms of the users and what what like vintage members wanted you know we we have a lot of data points we have the data points of member growth when you know there are certain prices and uh, and as mentioned you know when we are launching shipping discount you can see that the, the member uh, the member numbers and and the sales numbers are just you know shooting for the roof uh, so you can definitely see that in, in in those data points in terms of what our um, clients want when when we're talking about external clients of course it's you know talking to some prospect clients and figuring out what they want. But also, you know, we have been doing shipping at Vinted for many years. Um, we, uh, we have dealt with a lot of challenges. We know, for example, that tracking is always a very painful part for the end user when you are, for example, receiving multiple tracking statuses that does not say anything to you as a user. It's just, you know, some sort of code and, and some words in professional shipping language that you don't understand or when you get multiple uh, updates with the same statuses. So things like that, I think we sort of fished them out uh, while while having Vinted, uh, you know, as our mothership. Um, so that gave us a lot of a lot of in insights in terms of what what users want, what they don't want. And then with businesses, of course, we are learning a lot. We are talking with potential clients and we're understanding what their needs. We have some background from Vinted, but we are also, you know, adjusting every new client comes with, a, you know, slightly maybe different way of using our API, different needs. Uh, and, uh, and we are learning a lot as we go, you know, just through every single new client. So to, to maybe dig into this a little bit deeper, Mustafa from LinkedIn has the question. Uh, he wants advice about creating customer support and uh, the the relationship here is that we mined our customer support and found that these were the problems that people were having over and over again and that we were in a good place to to fix those things uh, and any advice about that that customer support and, and creating a good feedback loop there that's also uh, you know a, a good place to find business and uh, organizational opportunity Yes, yes, definitely. So, so we have uh, uh, we have multiple teams working on Vinted side, also on Vinted Go side, who are uh, who are just looking into into CS tickets and you know various groups of CS tickets and the reason of why those tickets were were born. I think for us, it's it's really a source of you know improvement, a source of uh, um, that that shows the the voice of the customers and and where we could definitely be better but uh, but you know if in terms of any sort of advice i think it's very easy to look at at cs tickets and raise their importance when you actually realize um, the cost to the business uh, that you know the dissatisfaction of the user brings um, so once once you start maybe, maybe you know putting a value on that on you know how much actually a bad user experience cost to the to the business and you see that for the tickets 
it's then in that, you know it's impossible to ignore that and it's impossible to not look at different you know groups of tickets and, and learn from them yeah well, anybody who has a reddit account knows the the the, the current trope of one bad experience and 70 percent of people will never use that company again uh, Joe Lane has called that out in our LinkedIn. I want to know more from Joe if he's list actually listening, because maybe there's some things that we can learn there. Uh, we do have to move on because uh, we, we do have some, some time limits. I, I will maybe take one more question because uh, there's, a, there's one from, from Dorian about uh, budget con constraints. Do you have, do we have, uh, or I said, do you have strict budget constraints and how do they influence your decision making process yes of, of course we do um uh, for me the budget constraints of course mostly manifest in you know how much we can we can invest in terms of you know like external tools or you know external support but also in terms of the headcount so it's it's uh, it's you know uh, very um very thoughtful planning that goes into this and we are of course planning our headcount and we we need to make sure that you know we are we are doing the best that we can with the people that we have not to just grow for the sake of growing or because we can we are very conscious about the budget because you know yes we are looking at the cost reduction so you cannot just blow out your own budget uh, because you will not be able to achieve your goals so so how we are dealing with that of course it's it's uh, different ways in, in terms of, you know, different different ways to deal with different problems. Uh, but uh, just one thing that I was discussing um, with, uh, with the teams an hour ago was, uh, you know, we are trying to build uh, something new, uh, this solution, and uh, what do we do? You know, do we add extra, uh, like, two, three, four, five teams? Or do we actually reprioritize what we have now? Maybe we, you know, stop doing some things that are already in the pipeline, um, start, you know, focusing on a new scope with the existing team. So, so there's always this aspect of uh, not just, you know, adding more and more and more and more teams uh, to your organization, but actually looking at, are we working on the most important things? If not, let's actually work on the most important things. And what I really like is that we have that flexibility of, of uh, you know, changing the scope of the team. I know it's it's not ideal and we don't, we try not to do it, uh, you know, very often. We only do it when we really are at the point when we have something really, really important longer term than what we are working on at the moment. And then we are looking at, you know, how to, how to reorganize ourselves in terms of priorities and how do we make sure that our teams are only working on the most important things. Um, there, if, if anybody wants to know more about this, I have an upcoming TED talk in my living room about OKRs and strategic planning and how that differs from financial planning. Hit me up on LinkedIn. I will I will talk at ad nauseum about this this and how we can we can do a return on investments based betting uh, for where we spend our time and our money and how that differs from uh, the the strategic 10x stuff. Any anywho, there's my my plug for my living room's TED talk. But we, we do need to move on. Stefan has been very patient. Uh, Stefan Heilman is the CTO at Seven Senders. And his talk is about how to scale people, processes, and technology as an innovative technology company. Uh, as companies scale up, like we've talked about before, and we saw in an ISIS uh, presentation, uh, so does the complexity from both the business, but also within tech. So the central question is, how do we deal with this complexity from a tech perspective? How do we even quantify it or, or identify it? And what does this mean for the people and the processes that work with this set technology? So, Stefan, please, the stage is all yours. Thank you. Okay, great, Adam. Thanks uh, for handing over. Um, before I go into that, um, actually, I found your, your question about the scaling up uh, very interesting. And just my my answer to that is actually, I've been in the last tr three roles I was in in organizations that were growing quite quickly. And if I just look at the tech part of it, um, 
then I was growing like by 50%, uh, growing the team in, in a span of a year or a year and an under half. And actually there's a lot of things that you can learn from this. Um, yeah, coming back to the presentation um, a little bit, um, seven senders, I would say we also do cross-border shipping. Um, so solving a very similar, uh, similar problem that Vinted Go is actually solving. Um, our focus is not our, it's not our own, uh, own business, but we come basically from the other side, other side. So for us, the customers are the e-commerce shops that have warehouses in one country and want to ship to different countries. Uh, we are also, uh, we're already in our seventh year and the other numbers actually, you can read them for yourselves. Uh, at the moment, we have about 300 employees and just focusing, I would say on the, on that part. A um, little bit more about myself. So my name is Stefan Hallman. Uh, I'm the CTO of Seven Senders. Um, and what's perhaps interesting, if you look at my at my resume, is I've worked at really large corporate organizations. I was at Allianz uh, for a couple of years. I also worked in management consulting before, and then I've sort of been in the in the startup world for a couple of years. And I'm actually swimming upstream. So Allianz, when I was there, was about 120 years old, and now Seven Senders is about seven years old. So <laughs> getting to the younger. Uh, uh, com uh, companies and very important i'm a strong believer in agile leadership principles and what do agile leadership principles mean for me as a cto that means i get to define the north star what's the cool goal that we want to achieve what are the guidelines um, that actually constrain us or that i sort of define and then have cool cross-functional teams who actually work towards the goals um and i would first want to start with what does actually mean scaling a business um and we look, when we look at back at the, the beginning of the smaller companies, like uh, you have one or two customers, you're the company and we do cross-border shipping. So we go to one, uh, to, you, we go to one destination, very easy. And then you grow. And then out of two customers, you get like five customers or even more customers. And from one destination, you get several uh, destinations. But the interesting thing, and this is what scaling brings is what I would call is complexity. It's not just adding two to the left and three to the right. Uh, it's added, actually multiplying it because you have the number of destinations. So it's not one customer goes to one country, but the customer goes to multiple countries. So basically it's it's growing um, over time. Um, you could also look at, at the scaling from a technical part of view because we have tech people here. So in the beginning, you have two APIs probably. Uh, and you have one module that you connect to, all very easy, PC. And then you scale up um, and out of those two APIs, you have five APIs, you have multiple modules and a lot of uh, connection and interaction. And actually that makes it way more complicated. Again, the complexity is growing. Um, generally speaking, when you scale up an organization, it means your, grow, your complexity is growing. And my strong belief is we as tech, we are responsible for thinking about this complexity, maintain it, contain it and then manage it in the end. I would say if I'm good as a, as a CTO, the complexity of, of the tech organization is just a little bit below the business complexity. I can't, um, I can't really have too much of a deviation, but I should be as close as possible to that. Um, and there's two, two ways to that. First, think about how to address the business complexity and then how to manage the complexity within tech. And let's first spend some time thinking about the business complexity. How can I reduce the complexity uh, in the business? Um, and that again comes with growing, standardized products and contracts. So if you've got one customer in the beginning, you will probably do everything you can to actually solve the problem for the customer. And then there's the next one and next one and next one. And before you actually think about it, you have 20 customers and 20 different products. And that actually kills you. Because then every change you need to every change you need to do in the system, you have to think about 20 edge cases. How does that work? So you need to reduce the products. Um, you might also have some customers who are just want a basic product, just ship package from A to B. And we heard about the, the things like notifications, tracking, and all of those things. Perhaps you have some premium customers. So differentiate between them again makes it easy because then you can also offer different prices, different service levels, and all those things. You also have to think about the, the uh, number of variants and exceptions. How do I reduce that? Not offering everything. And the last one, and I think a lot of companies don't think about this early enough, is actually fire customer. We all know the story about this one customer that basically had revenue from thousand euros and it actually took a 10 
person team just to take care of, of their findings. And I think that's something that we as tech also need to understand. What's the complexity behind it? Because sometimes we don't see it and then we spend a lot of effort and resources on a customer and sometimes firing the customer actually is the right choice. So assuming we've, we've reduced the complexity from the business side. So now, how do I think about complexity from a tech perspective? If I think about tech, I always think about three things, people, processes, and technology. Um, and obviously we are in tech here, so technology is important, but actually the people process are even uh, more um, important. Um, and when I think about the complexity in growing organizations, so for example, if I look at people, we, we need to think about growing from individual contributor to a leader. We have seen this many times, the first developer in an organization, an organization grows, you've got 10 developers and the first developer is the team lead. Okay, now he needs to understand how to become a leader. Then the organization grows and you've got not one team, but two, three or four teams. And you need to think about roles and responsibilities, like who's taking care of infrastructure, who's thinking about security, uh, which tools are we using and all of those things. So you need to really think about them. Development paths, very important. You want to keep people on the long term and people want to learn something new. I always would say a, a good developer is always looking to learn something new to be somewhere. And you have to find development paths. Again, if you're in a smaller company, hey, there's only so many people working on things, so everybody's seeing most of the things or getting the new things. If you grow, it gets harder, so you need to be formalized that a little bit more. And onboarding new people actually gets harder as you scale. If you have one person and adding a second one, okay, just sit both people next to each other, and after some time, they have the similar knowledge. Going from 20 to 40 people, you can imagine if you would just add 20 people to existing team of 20 people, basically nothing would get done but half a year because they were just talking and chatting and all that stuff. We also need to talk about processes. We heard about Kanban and Scrum and Scrumban or other things. You really need to think how you define them. How do we develop them? Uh, how do you think about documentation and KPIs? How do you think about continuous improvement processes? And this is in blue here because I will go into this in a little bit more detail in a second. Also about prioritization becomes more important. If you only have one team working on something, prioritization is easy. If you've got five teams working on things, makes harder because each team has their priority and then they have dependencies. And then sometimes people have a delay in one project and another project is delayed because of the dependencies. You need to think about this. And lastly, about technology, you need to think about the architecture. Again, in the beginning, architecture is easy. But as you grow, architecture becomes harder because you need to define how do I get new technology in? How do I get old technology out? What's the right right amount of technology? When do I actually use new technology for my mission critical things? And coming back to the development path, what do I do if my developer says, hey, here's a new technology I really would like to use. And then what? And then he leaves. And then you don't have anybody to actually uh, support this shiny new technology. Security also is a topic, not forgetting technical debt. Um, you need to think about how do I keep my, my systems uh, stable. Um, um, consolidation is another topic. How I do I reduce it? I talked about the complexity. The more systems I have, the higher my complexity is. So at some point in time, I just need to actually reduce it to do some consolidation. And then as you grow in the beginning, very often you have a lot of money that you can spend. You have a few people you can't sp spend too much. And then sooner or later, somebody comes back and says, hey, we should go on the path to profitability. So how can we actually keep our growth trajectory the same, but actually reduce our cost or keep the cost contained or whatever? And how do you do this? And how do you do this within technology like AWS? Like, okay, how do you spend 20% less to be on your AWS cost? Um, and all of those things, and this is very important, I would say, it also depends on the majority of involved teams in the organization. So you can just pick something and say, okay, I take the best practice approach and just implement it. You always need to think about how do the teams handle this? Do you have people who can actually do this? Do you have people who've seen it? How to implement? Do you understand what's the relevant part? What should you adapt to your organization and what perhaps you should keep the same? Um, I remember a Scrum Master once told me, if you introduce Scrum, please use the full Scrum process and don't leave anything out because the things that seem to be hard in your organization are usually the most relevant uh, parts. And there was especially things like retro and re reuse and stuff like that. So as I said, I want to go into more detail, starting with the continuous improvement processes. I think this is very important, especially as you grow. 
you need to work on your processes. And the larger you are, the harder it is changing processes. Previously, I worked at Allianz, and you can imagine how hard it is for an organization with 200,000 employees to change a process. Um, so the question is, how do you have time for it and how do you measure results? And I found one, I would say, secret weapon. And I'm sure that, or I think this is undervalued. And this is the post-mortem. And um, why is it undervalued? And why is it a secret weapon? So you have an incident. That means your systems are not doing what they should be doing. And so if you have some problems or the business usual is coming to you saying, hey, the system is not doing what it's supposed to be doing. Okay, you fix it. And then at the end of the incident, you write a post-mortem. The post-mortem includes what went wrong, why did it went wrong, and then what do we need to do in order to fix it? And the beauty of this is you've just had an incident. You can put fixing this incident very high on the priority list. So you can really use that to get rid of some of the problems in the system. I've seen that, and I've seen that in my teams as well. Oh, we have an incident. We fix it. Yeah, we, we should work on the underlying issues. Oh, we have too much pressure from the business. We're not working on it. Then you have the next incident and the next one. And every incident gets, gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And after some time, you have real huge outage. So I would encourage everybody, use the post-mortem. Try to fix the things. And the good thing is, if the business comes to you, you can always say, hey, we just had an incident. I'm really sorry, but we need to work on this now. And we might need to shift some of the, of the timelines a little bit, but we really should fix it. And you very often get, get support for it. Um, so, and the other part is always, how do we actually measure our KPIs? So as, as a tech organization, you certainly know this, the business says, hey, we have double the number of developers and we are actually at half the speed. So it takes us long, with more people, longer to achieve less. And that's always a problem. And we know this goes back to the complexity topic. But how do you actually show that you have the performance improvements? Um, and myself, I would say, look at three KPIs and focus on them. And you would always find we are techies here at heart. We can always find the edge case and all this stuff. I would say, don't care too much about it. Just start looking at this. First one is deployment frequency. So how often are we deploying? If you just deploy at the end of every sprint, you only generate value once things are deployed, obviously. And so you need to focus on this to improve the deployment frequency. Cycle time, similar. How long does it take us from looking at the um, at a ticket for the first time until it's live? Let's try to work on this. And the last one, planning accuracy. How good are the teams actually forecasting how much they will do in the next sprint? And those three, they seemed very easy, but actually when you look at them, they help you improve quite a bit. And the beauty of those numbers is you can share them. You can at least partially compare them across teams and you have good discussion. Uh, so I find them way better than velocity because we all know velocity is very hard. You cannot compare it between teams and it's very easy to improve your velocity by 10%. You just sort of estimate the tickets a little bit higher. So how did we look at this? So one example was cycle time. So we said we want to improve cycle time. Okay. First thing was start measuring it. What's the cycle time? In the beginning, we didn't know this at all. Then we were measuring it and we're just talking about, oh, this is the cycle time. This is what we're seeing. Um, looking at the outliers, there's a ticket that takes 200 days to life. Why is it? Um, and then have the teams start uh, implementing the first ideas how to improve the cycle time. Thinking about this, think about the outliers, think about the process and all of this stuff. And then you see the cycle time goes up over time. This, is, this takes some time actually, because it takes time until it's effective. But once you see it, this really improves it. And again, the beauty is you can go back to the business and say, hey, we improved our cycle time. This means new features go live more quickly. We generate value when things are live. So actually we are generating more value. So we do more with less. Um, <clears throat> another topic is how can I reduce uh, my complexity through consolidation? Uh, I'm not really too proud of this, of this page actually, but I think it's a good example. And you can also find other examples. Like, assume you have three source control systems. We have GitLab, GitHub, GitLab, and Bitbucket. Why would you have three? Yeah, coming back to the scaling, you have different teams. One said GitHub is good, one said GitLab is good, one is Bitbucket is good. And so the question is, how do we actually reduce that to get to do the migration while the business is, is growing? And says, we have a lot of pressure on the team. Of course, still, we are growing quite a bit. 
So the main point here is, and I've seen this, and I've seen this process not only with migration to one source repository. Previously, I used that same process to actually migrate offline to AWS or other topics. And it's always the same steps. First, define the goal and guidelines. And this is important. What are the priorities and what do we do later? So in this example, I said, okay, I want to, instead of three source repositories, I just want to have one. In the, so in the other example we had where we were migrating from data center to AWS, I said, don't want to be cloud native. I just want to switch off the servers in the data center. Uh, then establish proposed timeline and priority versus other topics. I would always say that a timeline should be something between two to four months. I think you can get a lot of things done in that time. Um, if it's too long, then people will put it off and you're working on it. If it's too short, you probably will not achieve your goal. Then share this with the whole organization. Talk to the business. Why are we doing this? Why is this relevant? And if the business says we don't need it, then you need to go back to step one and make sure that what you're doing actually helps it. Then set up progress reporting, burn down chart. Make the teams responsible. Very important. I talked about the agile leadership principle. It's not my goal. Basically, yes, I said it. I said the North Star, but I have, I need the teams. I need the buy-in from the teams. The teams should do it. And then review process towards the goal and correct as required. Very important. Uh, and here is an example that I brought was the burn down chart where we said, okay, we had about 50 repositories that we needed to, to migrate. And then we said, okay, every day automatically we just collect how many repositories are still left. And you see in the beginning you start and then you have a lot of progress and then you stall a little bit and you work on more complex topics. Um, and then you get, get a lot of done and then in the end you, see you have the very hard ones and then you need to focus to also get that done. So basically that was uh, my short introduction, how to do uh, scaling up in an innovation, innovative logistics uh, company, thinking about people, processes and technology and also giving you a very short and quick deep dive on topics, how you can actually implement it. Thank you. And do we have any questions? Well, I, I certainly have a bunch and I, and I know other people do too. Um, one of the things that is, is difficult is actually like quantifying that complexity. What kind of tips do you have for us for quantifying that complexity in the technology and the processes and the organization? Sometimes we split teams, we make our problems worse because wow, now it's just now it's just crazy town. Yeah. yeah, actually that's that's an interesting point. And I would um for me, a measure of complexity always is the I would say the connections that you have between different items, I would say, or topics. So if you look at an organization, organization complexity is the number of teams that need to interact with each other. I think that's a good point. When I look at, from a business perspective, how many markets, how many customers, how many types of customers do I actually have? And in the world where that we are in, basically we have customers on one hand side, so we are scaling with the customers. We have countries as the second side, so we're scaling the number of countries. And then the last one, we also have the last mile carriers that we work together. So basically, and you need to, mu to multiply all three with each other, so that's actually growing. And from a pure tech perspective, I would always look at like, how many repositories do you have? How many technologies do you have and all this stuff? It's not, it's not one number where they are five, five is the right number, but it's something that should tell you how does it basically feel like? Is it like, do I have five repositories? Okay, how large are they? Do I have 250? And what's the relationship to the team size? I talked to to one CDO colleague who said, oh, we're doing microservices now, we have 30 services. And I thought, oh, okay, 30 services. We also have 30 services, so that seems reasonable. And then later on, it came out, he has one team that is like six developers. And I thought, the six developers, if you've got 50 services or 30 services, this is too much because you have a lot of overhead. Uh, conversely, there's also people say, oh, we have five services and talk about 300 developers. I think it might also be a challenge. Well, then that, that that leads into the question, how do you know? Like there, there's that feel, but there are there things that you look for in your environment that tell you maybe we've taken a step too far with either um, the, the number of repositories, number of teams that need to interact, the number of products those teams are working on. Like how, how do you know? Um, I think it's, this is 
easy actually to understand it because the it, it shows you that it's hard if it gets hard to do things like if i say okay i need a small change on the web page and if i find out i need five teams to get this live and if i do this then two other projects are delayed then i see there's too much too much linkage and then you sh should try to separate and understand where this comes from oh yeah i need qa but QA needs to do this and infrastructure is needed here and we need to change something here and data needs to be done and all of that stuff if that's the case then you should should try to reduce it so i would always look at how long does something really take from i have a good idea till it's live and how hard is it to actually get this done in a reasonable time frame well you you are you already covered my my favorite metric <laughs> as an agile coach and as an agile uh, software development engineer and, and, and leader cycle time. And now you've int actually introduced the concept of lead time, because that, that means, you know, that's, that goes from like when, when product first puts it in as something, Ooh, we should do this to act when somebody can actually give us feedback on it. Um, those are very difficult measures to influence. And as, as you said, when those things start to draw out, um, it, it can be, you know, that can be an indication that something is wrong. I, I think uh, one thing that you've mentioned it, it, with the postmortems and with uh, this topic is when you, you should be retrospecting and dissecting the things as you go along. You don't have to wait for a big, bad catastrophe to happen to ask why this happened the way it happened. Do that more often. But how, how, do, you, how do you influence those cycle time and, and lead time metrics do you have any secret sauce that you can you can share with us um uh, actually i think there's no there's no silver bullet in the answer but i think there's a lot of things how you do it and i would always say as a cto my job is working on the organization versus working in the organization so one thing that i realized and that was perhaps some of the secret sauce so we did in post-mortem was interesting and then the outcome was we need a dba and we didn't have a dba and therefore it failed and then i dug deeper and said why did we need a dba and what's the real root cause and do this two or three times and in the end we found out if we are honest there were two root causes one was we had never archived any data so the database was way bigger than it should have been uh, so that means if it's a bigger database and you need to do some schema change in that case, it takes a long time and basically you lock the database for two hours and if it's a main database, your system goes down. Surprise. Uh, the other part of this was um, we had a test suite that was just not close enough to production. There were good reasons for both of them. So I wouldn't go into the answers because they're not, not so interesting. But the other thing is interesting understand what the real root causes are and your role as a leader is to push the teams don't come back with the easy answer it's always easy oh we didn't have the we didn't have a dba we need a dba next time no think about it what is it and then make the teams responsible because it's very easy to say oh somebody else will save us someone i can't do anything somebody else is no you need to do something and do something that has an impact in the next sprint that's always what I try to tell the teams. There needs to be one ticket that if I come back to you in two weeks or three weeks, depending on the sprint cycles or whatever, some small thing that you've done to fix the underlying problem. So, yeah, I, 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 I love these things um, because it is, this is how I think that, that stuff should be done. And it is difficult to actually make things run this way. And for those of you who are leaders out there, uh, I think Stefan... Stefan um, I don't know, maybe you can, you can say that I'm full of it, but I would say that this is part of that role of working on the organization and it takes an immense amount of emotional input on helping the teams to see this, this responsibility, uh, to ask the questions over and over again when it seems like you're asking, you know, you're just talking to a, a, a wall here. You need to keep going and put your emotional energy into this to help the teams get there. If people who think that uh, management is a cushy job uh, haven't really done it right, uh, <laughs> uh, you know that, that's 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 my experience. It it keeps you up at night. You put in blood, sweat, and tears 
do you really worry about like what people are are, are thinking and how this is impacting their their daily life with the uh with the responsibility bit i've found that there's a, there's a process to i think christopher avery puts a, a a process out there he calls the responsibility process about how it leads through different stages blame shame uh justification obligation and responsibility and keeping people at that level of responsibility where they have to do something and they want to do something have to and want to is part of our jobs as as leaders no matter if you're in marketing and uh, software engineering logistics managing a warehouse whatnot uh, or do you have any helpful hints for the people uh, you know that are, that are listening in about encouraging people to take responsibility because it's one thing to put it in a bullet point in your your presentation stefan it's another thing to actually make it happen yeah um i think as a leader there's two or three things that you should do um and first you can only offer it it's one of the things i can offer you to take responsibility but the other side has to pick it up uh so you need the right people but you also need to create the circumstances for that so the first for me is motivating why is it a problem for me like the emotional part but also the, the real part. hey we had an incident and we need to be stable and all of this thing so they understand it so the why is, is very important um, and then the other part is i need to sort of support and shield the teams you take responsibility but I, in the end i'm still responsible so you do it i tell you where i want to go you can act on it, but if if something happens, I cannot stand around saying he did it wrong. It's my role as as a leader, and to do that, and then just help them. Honestly, this is what I've seen. Help them breaking it down. Very often they say, "Oh, there's so many things I can't do." Okay, first step. What are the first things that we can do? What can you do next week? Okay, let's come back. Let's get catch up next week. Let's see what you've done. Then you come up with a new idea. The important thing is you need to support them. But the ownership needs to lie with the teams. And I've, one example that I had and was very interesting, I, um, I did all of the steps and I said something. And they came back and said, okay, I want to do step A, B, C, and D. And I was looking at this and I thought, okay, I would just do different steps. My preference was something else. But then I thought, honestly, I care about the outcome and I care about the ownership. So I told them, okay, challenge them that, okay? And I said, okay, I probably would do it differently, but Hey, you need to do it. I will fully support you. And even if we find out this is not the right way about it, we'll learn something together and do it. And actually in the end, it was it worked. So that was was relevant for me. And they learned something. And that was good. But it was a challenge for me as a leader because it was just like, I would go left and they were going right. And I was like, oh. But you need to do that. If you cannot do this, and there was, that was a crucial, for me a crucial moment for me as a leader. If I had told them, no, we're not going left, we're going right then they wouldn't have taken the ownership because then it was my decision to do it. And then they would find all reasons of, oh, he doesn't know, and this is not working, and they had a lot of things. If you put it the other way, they have a lot of options because it was their choice. I, 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 I really love that you're saying, I want to have, I want to have a beer or, or somewhere in Berlin, maybe a curry verse or something with you. And maybe if there's other people who feel similarly, we, we can have a, a little... Uh, coffee clutch to discuss these things because so these are very interesting topics I I really uh, agree with this you know and, and especially as a leader you might be wrong you might learn something but the, you know I have I have one rule which is I will accept skin knees I will not accept broken legs so if, if something looks like it's going to hurt somebody or damage the company irreparably then we say no but otherwise yeah like start start rolling out the the old uh, you know the old net for their their high wire act and see if you if you can uh try and engage where they might need you to stand with it in order to catch them when they fall and maybe you learn that this is possible to do without falling and that's part of the fun too uh, so Stefan, i i do have to uh put a, a, like a start to wrap things up here um is there any are there any closing thoughts or any closing questions for the audience that you'd like to ask? Um, I would just say if you're if you're really a leader, think about this working on the organization as in the organization. That's one I very often see. And this is this depends, this is for leadership on all levels, because if leader is not 
uh, I'm the best one at doing something, but I also think about the bigger picture. So I would encourage everybody to think about those things, how you can affect change and think about what you can do. Very often I had this in a lot of companies that say, oh, the white knight is saving us. No, there's no white knight, but we can save us. We have a lot of things that we can do. That's the beauty of tech, basically. We have almost unlimited possibilities to do things. So use it. So th this this is a good book. I, I, I think maybe, Stefan, you, you've read this. If you haven't read it, other people talks about this 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 subject, the fifth discipline. Mm -hmm. It's now an oldie when I was... When I was your age, kids at home, this was a, a, a new bestseller, but it, there's still a lot of good information in there about this topic. About It, it deals with empirical process and, and learning through empiricism, which is really just agile by any other name. Uh, I would encourage people to, to pick that one up. I've dropped a link for a survey, for SurveyMonkey, in both uh, the YouTube and the LinkedIn uh, chat windows. If everybody has a chance, please fill that out. Let us know how we did. Let me know how I did. If you have any feedback for me as, as a presenter, reach out to me on, on LinkedIn as well and just let me know how I can be better, how I can make this more useful for you. We're going to be doing another one of these in December. Um, and we don't have a, a topic or a theme yet. And some of that will be derived from who wants to speak. And I'm working on things, reacting to your feedback as a presenter and a public speaker. I am not great at it, but I'm doing it. I don't like it particularly. It's not my favorite thing in the world, but I'm doing it and I'm getting better at it with your feedback. If you want to do the same thing, we will help you with this. The community will help you. I will help you. Everybody involved in this will help you to do this. So if you think that this might be helpful for you, a, a skill for you to learn this presenting or you have a topic that you're passionate about that you want people to know about, we will help you get that across. Let us know, and that might help define the theme that we have for December 8th. So with that, I wanted to I wanted to uh, uh, lock my Mac. Great. Uh, with that, I, I want to bring things to a close and, and thank both Stefan and Aista for their participation. Um, there's German Tech Jobs which is a great platform to get connected in the German tech scene, even if you do not sprechen Sie Deutsch. Um, there's a, a lot of companies do not require that. And, and, uh, but, and if, if, but if that's something that makes you comfortable, there are companies that do require uh, that you, you speak there. So, but if you uh, are looking for uh, your next opportunity, check that out. Check out YouTube's uh, We Work at Vintage channel if you didn't already look at it to find this event. We also are uh, promoting things on LinkedIn. Hey, hey, check out Seven Senders too. I guess you're a, a competitor of ours, but you're also really friendly people who are willing to help grow the community. So uh, shout out to Seven Senders and Stefan, if you like working with people like him or me, uh, check out our, our jobs posts too. So we look forward to all of your good stories. We, I look forward to all of the things that you want to talk about at the next one and, and really uh, enable the future learnings of this community. So thank you, and please uh, continue to participate. Good night, everybody.